Uh, I'm Dr. Derek Lee. I'm thrilled to introduce a pioneer and innovator in non-fusion scoliosis surgery, Dr. Randall Betts. Now, uh, Dr. Betts, not only are you a trailblazer in uh, VBT, but uh, you took it a step further with ASC. How did you initially conceive of ASC in terms of your thought processes? Well, we started VBT back in 2011, and we started to see um, a lot of patients coming in for consults, wanting the non-fusion correction. And unfortunately, they were more mature. They had missed the growing window. Mm -hmm. So we used Sanders, which is a score looking at growth plates in the hand. And um, it was thought if they were over a Sanders 4, they probably didn't have enough growth left for just putting the cord and screws in to correct the spine. So we started doing mature patients, but we found that you had to get them completely corrected. So we, um, in order to do that, we needed to make a small incision instead of just the portals, the thoracoscopic portals. You needed a small incision so that you could put the two towers on and actually derotate each vertebral segment. Mm -hmm. And because you're just you're stuck with the muscles and ribs when you do thoracoscopic portals, you can't do the extensive correction you need to do. So by making a small incision, we can actually derotate the spine a hundred percent. And it's really what you see on x-ray is a curve, but what's really caused that curve is the vertebrae have rotated. So we correct that. And then there's some patients who had very stiff curves. So as they've lived with the curve for uh, several years, the discs get dry and they get stuck and the spine's in a rigid position, especially right at the center, which we call the apex. And so on occasion, if that was not flexible when we got them asleep and tried to correct it. Then we started cutting the discs. We call it a disc release. And it's an important differentiation. We don't take the disc out. It's not a fusion. We cut the annulus and we sometimes have to remove the nucleus um, to get it to be mobile. And then once it's mobile, we can derotate that segment of the spine. And on the ones we've been back to on a rare occasion, that disc looks almost like it's healed, um, period. So that um, if you look at a chicken bone, you see the white glistening surface on the end of a chicken bone. That's the cartilage. You have the same thing on each side of the vertebrae. And so we leave that intact, and that's why it doesn't fuse. It still slides. And just like any other ligament in the body, if you tear it, ankle ligament, you tear knee ligament, then the uh, ligaments will heal. Here we're cutting them surgically with a knife, so it's a nice clean cut, and since it's collagen, it will heal again. Okay, excellent. Um, do you also do any incisions on the anterior longitudinal ligament as well in order to increase flexibility, or that stays intact? No, the anterior longitudinal ligament is actually almost incorporated into that annulus, the circular structure of the disc, so it gets cut also. And that, like any other ligament, it just grows back. But mm -hmm. it will heal when the spine's in a corrected position. Um, question for you, because there seems to be a little bit of controversy regarding disc release, where some surgeons feel that it will lead to um, faster degeneration and fusion, but you've noticed that not to be the case? Correct. So. Before we started doing this, we um, have a, had a lot of experience with disc surgery. Between Dr. Antonacci, Dr. Cudahy, and myself, I've been involved in spine surgery for myself almost 40 years, Daryl 25 years, and Dr. Cudahy 15 years. So we've done a lot of adult surgery, a lot of disc surgery. So where the controversy arises, there is some animal work that if you take a lumbar disc, um, in an animal model and just puncture it, that it can go on to degenerate. And so um, a lot of um, 
surgeons are very familiar with degenerative discs in the lumbar spine and spend a lot of time fusing them for back pain. In many meetings, Dr. Antonacci and myself have asked uh, surgeons, like there may be 200 in the room, and how many have fused a lumbar degenerative disc? Every hand goes up. How many of you ever fused a degenerative thoracic disc? No hands. It just doesn't happen in the thoracic spine. So even though that animal work was done in lumbar spines, it was never done in thoracic spines. So, so the, um, the premise for doing it before we started doing it was sound. We didn't think that we were gonna be causing any permanent injury. So since we've been doing that, we've um, first disc release we did was five years ago. So we have a pretty good follow-up. Uh -huh. And out of 470 patients, we have one that maybe there might be pain related to the disc. And I say maybe because um, there's a little tiny signal on an MRI. Um, and but it's so small, it's hard to believe that that's what's causing the patient's pain. Um, but that's like one out of, you know, 470 patients. So um, we're, uh, and that's a maybe. So we're pretty confident that it doesn't cause um, pain, at least in the um, intermediate period. We have not seen it. Five years, still very short. So what we tell parents and patients is, Worst case scenario, let's say 20 years from now, the um, disc does become painful for some reason. There's already now approved disc regeneration injections. So um, if it started to hurt, you, um, you, the patient would get an injection. And the absolute worst case with 2020 technology is you would just fuse that one disc. Mm -hmm and to eliminate the pain. So uh, it's certainly better than fusing, you know, 9, 10, 11, 12 segments. Absolutely. Do you so that, that's kind of the logic and the experience. And you're absolutely right. It's something that um, everyone's concerned about. Uh, absolutely. Well, thanks for clar clarifying that. Do you stick primarily to the thoracic spine? With the disc release? Yeah, with the disc release, yes. On, yeah. I think out of those 470 patients, we've had to cut one or two discs at T12L1. And I think there's one patient that had like a 130 degree curve in the lumbar spine and we had to cut uh, L1, L2. But most times, 98% of the time, the lumbar discs are much more flexible than the thoracic. Absolutely. Because that was going to be my next question. What happens if it's a severe or you know, very rigid curve in the lumbar spine? Then you'd have to go there in terms of disc release. Yes. Okay. Um, I, I like what you said in terms of, you mentioned in, that in most cases, spinal curvatures like scoliosis and specifically hypokyphosis uh, need to be detethered for optimal correction. Can you talk about that a bit? Correct. So um, again, you've got to be able to, if, if the, let's just say the young lady's 15 years old, so she's totally mature, no growth left. Um, if we're gonna do this, we wanna try and get the spine entirely straight and back to the normal position. And the, so now we're not dealing with growth modulation, we're dealing with remodeling. Ideally, we wanna, the cord and the screws hold it in place, and hopefully over X period of time, um, the spine will remodel such that theoretically you could take the cord out, but we don't. But uh, at this point in time, we don't know what the speed of that remodeling is. But the key is, we have learned that you've got to get it straight or almost straight. So if those discs are uh, if the spine is rotated and then stuck in that rotation, then you have to cut the annulus and the longitudinal ligament um, to free that segment up so you can rotate it back to a normal position. Now, one of the etiologies of thoracic scoliosis and probably lumbar is that the vertebral segments in the front of the spine, the anterior spine, grows more than the back and it's too long. 
And so when that's how scoliosis gets started, the spine's too long in the front. When the child tries to bend forward, they can't because they're up against a long segment in the spine. So the way they compensate for that, the spine rotates and allows the child to bend forward. So in order to make this work, sometimes if we see it on x-ray in the operating room that the anterior spine's too long, then uh, sometimes we'll cut the disc, um, take the nucleus out to shorten that anterior column to help allow us to derotate it back to a normal position and get the uh, correct alignment of the thoracic spine. Where that also is important is when you have that hypokyphosis, or sometimes it's actually true thoracic lordosis, that means the thoracic spine's caved in um, and too long in the front. It creates a compensatory cervical kyphosis, meaning the neck, instead of having a nice curve uh, that uh, so the head's back, the cervical spine then compensates uh, for that thoracic abnormality by jutting forward. We call that cervical kyphosis, which in adults then is going to be associated with long-term neck pain. So there's an added benefit of correcting that thoracic hypokyphosis to a normal thoracic kyphosis um, and then getting a compensatory correction in the cervical um, spine. And we have data that uh, we're getting ready or working on publishing that shows that with this ASC, we're able to get about uh, 20 to 30 degrees of correction of that hypokyphosis when needed. So it, uh, we have the data to support the concept. <laughs> well, that's a huge correction because normally with um, typical VBT, it seems that you're hoping for maybe five or 10% with a little bit of that um, tension, but you can't because there's not enough space in order to compensate for the anterior wedging, right? Yeah, so our, my experience with the VBT um, in our own cases, because uh, we did a lot of just VBTs early on, mm -hmm. and of others, and as I've observed other people with just VBT, it doesn't really correct that hypokyphosis very much, maybe 5%, which is not enough. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. So you've had, I assume you've had quite a few um, patients with, you know, severe thoracic hypokyphosis or thoracic lower doses that have responded quite well in 20, 20 degrees. Is that kind of the average you're getting, or is that at the extreme end of your? No, no. So I think um, the average is probably 20. I didn't look at the paper recently, but um, with you know some cases up above 30 degrees of correction. So mm. you know, the ideal um, kyphosis is 30 degrees, po positive 30 degrees. So if they have minus 10, um, then we're trying to get them back to that 30. So you can see it's a you know, 30 degree correction. <laughs> yeah, it's a 40, well, it's a 40 degree 40 spin, degree. Right? Yeah, that's pretty hard to get 40 degrees, but we can get to, we've got well, a lot of 30s. <laughs> well, I'm going from the minus 10 to the 30. Anyway, yeah. this is a very um, interesting topic for myself because my son is uh, very, um, is, has a lower dotic uh, thoracic and it was very interesting going through the research in terms of the anterior vertebral overgrowth and how that drives rotation leading to the, uh, this coronal curve. Now, question I have is that, because in my brain, I'm looking at the spine as a spring that as the spine goes into hypokyphosis, it rotates because that spring has to kind of pop in a certain direction to relieve pressure. Right. Now, if you bring it back to the center, uh, are you kind of reloading that spring? And does the spine kind of want to go in a different direction? So that's where the disc release and removing the nucleus helps. Mm -hmm. So you're temporarily taking out that spring because the nu you're absolutely right. That nucleus, um, if you didn't cut the disc and take the nucleus out, it would just want to spring right back. Mm -hmm. So you're absolutely right. So you take out the nucleus and, and by cutting the annulus, you've decompressed it. Maybe you've shortened it five millimeters. Right. And so you do that over three or four segments. Now you have significant um, 
shortening of that anterior column. So you, you absolutely right. We describe that to patients taking the torque out of the system. Mm -hmm. So you, you call it a spring. So the yes. same concept. <laughs> <laughs> absolutely. And it's basically just trying to get enough space in the anterior column for you to actually work in the sagittal plane, right? Correct. Okay. Um, now with the disc releases, do you, again, there's a little controversy in terms of disc release as the, as the spine is still growing versus a more mature spine. Do you make any distinction between the two or it just depends on a case by case? Yeah. So if they have a lot of growth left, um, mm -hmm. we may only cut one or two discs sometimes to right at the apex of that hypokyphosis. And they don't need a lot of disc releases for the coronal correction because they're going to grow that. Um, versus as they're mature, if they're done growing and they have, you know, big hypokyphosis, then you need to do four or five so you can really shorten it. Okay. So there is a distinction, but we, we still need to cut them sometimes in the, um, in the immature patients. And as we've started to do patients with early onset scoliosis, meaning six, seven, eight year olds, um, when they have 100 degree curves, the only way you can get it down in a reasonable range is to cut the discs. Okay. And that's why um, you and your associates are famous for your excellent corrections going as close to zero as possible. Correct. Okay. Now, um, because we're running out of time, question I have for you is that You've gone through VBT, you were the um, trailblazer in terms of ASC. What do you see next on the horizon? Um, it's interesting you asked that. So <laughs> I started some work um, um, almost, uh, I guess now it's going on 20 years that I've still been working on this. And I just this March got the patent. So it's called, um, intravertebral uh, osteotomy correction. And so the new term that I've decided to nickname is vertebral body modification. Mm -hmm. And what that involves is if the patient's mature and has a really badly wedged vertebrae, and we don't think that that's going to remodel because it's so severe, um, that you can actually cut the vertebral body and put in this implant that actually corrects the wedging and holds in place. And that can be done with or without a, um, a screw head. So you could also put it in the middle with the cord, or it could just be a standalone device. And it's also going to be used for correcting patients with degenerative scoliosis at the other end of the spectrum, like the 60 year old with a wow. Um, a new onset curve that um, from degenerative disc and have a pinched nerve. And uh, so I'm pretty excited about it. And so I think uh, over the next 10 years, you'll see this slowly develop. No, that's fascinating. That's a game changer because you're, you're not limited to, um, I, I would say, uh, trying to crack curves with minimal wedging. Now you can go to more, it's more drastic uh, wedging or degeneration. Exactly. Correct. And you'd also probably be able to do that for, uh, would you maybe congenital um, vertebrae, et cetera? Hmm. Fascinating. Yep. Correct. So I'd like to say uh, we're running out of time. I have to let you go because I know you have another meeting. So thank you very much. Happy to, happy to do this again and update if it's helpful. It's completely helpful. I'm sure the, uh, the viewers are going to love it. They are quite technical as well and they've, and they're very interested in, everything you spoke about, including the disc release and your rationale and how you do and what you've observed. Thank you very much. You're welcome. Nice okay. talking to you. Thank Great you. Questions. Bye. Thank you. Have a good day.